true crime friends. Welcome back to another episode of True Crime in Academia. I am your host, Mary DePippi. I hope you are all having a wonderful week. Well, I hope you had a wonderful week. It's Friday. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I was going to do the Patreon episode this week, but it's like my birthday weekend. My birthday is next Tuesday. Um, and actually is related to this case, which I didn't realize until I started doing the research and the notes for it. Um, so I kind of felt it would be fitting to put, you know, the weekend or the episode before closest to my birthday, I guess. Um, also like I've just been feeling really like mentally drained. I don't know if anyone else is feeling this way. I don't know if it's because of the time change and the season change. I've just been like exhausted, And, like, I've had, like, some physical energy to, like, work out and do things and whatnot. But, like, having any sort of, like, real motivation to do things has been super difficult. So that's also in part why (laughs) this week's not a Patreon episode because it will be a big one. But I am taking two days off for my birthday. So I'm planning to do some reorganizing in my room, but I'm hoping the one day I will get some research done for the Patreon episode because, again, I picked it specially for, you know, my birthday. It's a particular case that I wanted to cover for a long time. It just doesn't fit in with true crime and academia. So anyway, we are back on with or, you know, we're with Death in the Dorms still the ABC series that is streaming now on Hulu and we will be covering episode five. So without any further ado, let's get into it. On March 28th, 2019, the seniors of the University of South Carolina were preparing for graduation and just soaking up every last moment they had of this college experience And, of course, were partying at the local bar district called Five Points. On this particular night, a senior law student named Samantha Josephson went out with her friends to a bar called the Bird Dog. At around 2 a.m., Samantha decided that she was ready to go home, even though her friends and roommates weren't. But no big deal. She just called an Uber. Shortly after, her roommates decide that they want to leave too, but when they return home and expect to see Sammy, she isn't there. Samantha Josephson was born on August 13, 1997, to parents Marcy and Seymour Josephson in Robbinsville, New Jersey. She had an older sister named Sydney, who Sydney recounts she always liked to point out that she was only 20 months younger than Sydney because... People always assumed that they were two years apart, and she just really liked pointing out that it wasn't a full two years, as there were only a year difference in school. Sammy was described as being silly, goofy, the life of the party, always wanting to make people smile, and just overall very caring and kind. Her friend Jessica Samuel said that you could always tell that Sammy was up to no good, but you knew you would have fun doing it. As she got older, Sammy decided that she wanted to be a lawyer because she really just enjoyed helping people. After a school visit with her sister, Sydney, she decided that she wanted to attend the University of South Carolina. And when it came time to apply, Sammy got in. Her first day of college fell on her 18th birthday, and she just absolutely thrived there. She joined a sorority called Alpha Gamma Delta, and started dating a guy named Greg. And by all accounts, they were very happy together. Because she wanted to go to become a lawyer, she obviously had to apply for law school. So she wanted to be closer to home, and she applied to Rutgers and to Drexel. Now, Drexel, she was given a full-ride scholarship, which she did ultimately decide to go to. She also did get some money for Rutgers, but obviously... When you're comparing the two, I mean, unless she really wanted to go and Rutgers had a better law school than Drexel, which I don't think they do. I think they're about the same. But, um, you know, obviously you're going to pick the full ride over, you know, not a full ride, obviously. On March 28th, 2019, which is my birthday, 
Sammy had called her dad to see if she could use his credit card for when she needed to get an Uber because her and her friends were going to this bar called the Bird Dog. And her father, Seymour, had said in the episode, you know, that sometimes her card just wouldn't work for the Uber app. So she sometimes had to use his, but she always called to get permission from him. And he said that this was the last time he spoke to his daughter. The next day, Marcy, Samantha's mother, gets a call frantically from Greg. And he tells her that they can't find Sammy. Now, of course, Marcy is confused and she's like, well, what do you mean you can't find Sammy? And Greg explains to her that while he was home in Charleston, he had talked to her roommates and said that they couldn't find her and that she didn't come home the night before when they had went to the bird dog. Greg also told Marcy that he's leaving Charleston, driving down to Columbia, which is where the University of South Carolina is, and he's going to meet his friends and they're going to go look for her. Marcy immediately calls her husband, Seymour, and is like, did you hear from Greg? And when he tells her no, she explains to him the whole situation that they can't find Sammy. So Seymour then calls to Sydney to tell her that she needs to come home because he and Marcy have to go down to the University of South Carolina because they think she's missing. Now, at this point, Sydney admits that she wasn't necessarily worried because she just figured maybe her phone went off. Maybe she stayed at a friend's house. You know, she's probably fine. However, when Seymour calls one of her roommates before they leave and asks her, you know, like, what's going on? The roommate tells him that they've called the cops. So clearly this is serious enough that, you know, the roommates are even worried. Now, not to say that roommates being worried isn't an abnormal or weird thing, but given that this is a college, you know, and they're out drinking and they have friends here and there, you know, it's possible that she could have just went somewhere without telling anyone. But the fact that they know that this isn't like her They get really scared, so that's why they call the police department. Now, there's also a separate team aside from the Columbia Police Department that is investigating Sammy's disappearance, and it's called the South Carolina Law Enforcement. I forget there is an acronym, but for some reason, I did not write it down, and I cannot think of it off the top of my head. But essentially, it's another law enforcement agency within South Carolina, as the name suggests, And they assist with, like, manpower. And when they arrive, officers arrive there, they are tasked with interviewing her roommates. And the roommates pretty much all say the same thing, that they all went to the bird dog bar at five points. And that Sammy decided she wanted to go home early, which was around 2 a.m. And she gets into an Uber. Now, when her roommates return home, Sammy's not there. Now, the roommates tell them that they have some sort of tracking system within their phones. I mean, we all know that we can share our locations via our smartphones and things like that, but they had like a system so that way someone was always tracking one person. And they tell law enforcement that they see her phone going into the Rosewood area, which is fairly close to the Five Points Bar District, before it stops and then the phone turns off. As Seymour and Marcy are driving down to the University of South Carolina, they are on the phone with the police officers and the police department getting updates, but they are told that they are to go right to the police department when they arrive in South Carolina because Seymour also says in the episode that he remembers them asking multiple times, what's your ETA? How close are you? How soon are you going to get here? And the second that he hears that they need to go right to the police department, He said he looked at his wife and he just he just knew it was something was wrong and that it was going to end badly. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? If so, the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. Have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting? television show, or other form of media? The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. 
In addition to the articles published in the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog as well as personal essays on its popular Here's My Story section. This allows people like you to share their own experiences with our readers. To learn more about submitting either to the print or the online edition of the GNLR, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org and scroll down to the bottom of the page to find a link to their writer's guidelines. If you have any questions, email stephen.hemrick at glreview.org. The GNLR can't wait to see what you have to say. And remember that they're offering an exclusive code with the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So when you subscribe to the magazine, you'll receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. So that's seven issues instead of six. Again, just visit the glreview.org and click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR for your free issue. Clarendon County receives a call from two men who are out turkey hunting. And while they are out hunting turkeys, they stumble upon the body of a deceased woman. Based off of the woman's appearance alone, it is obvious to investigators that this woman was brutally murdered. And based off of the description of the clothes that Sammy was wearing the night of her disappearance, police are starting to believe that this woman found in the field is Sammy. In the afternoon of March 30th, 2019, Seymour and Marcy make it down to the police department. And they are met in a room with a bunch of people. And Marcy states that one particular person caught her eye because he was wearing a jacket that said, Coroner. Seymour and Marcy are told that a deceased woman matching Sammy's description was found. And that they were confident that this was Sammy. And because of DNA testing, they confirm that the woman found in the field is in fact Sammy. Investigators start combing through CCTV footage and they find some from outside of the bird dog. Sammy is seen out front and it's obvious that she's looking for her Uber. Soon after, a dark Chevy Impala pulls up and Sammy gets in. However based off of like her Uber records and her phone records, they confirmed that this was not her Uber. In fact, they learned that her Uber had actually been canceled because she was not at the location that she was supposed to be at or whatever, which I can not stand. I mean, I understand to some extent, you know, if you're driver, you're driving, depending on where you're picking someone up from, you don't always have the time to really check and look for the person that is looking for you. But, you know, how many times have you gotten that, like, your ride was canceled, and you're like, dude, I didn't even see you, or you drove right by me. Like, what the fuck? This is why I don't use Uber, everyone. I mean, aside from this case and, like, the situation of this case, I don't like to use it, but this whole them canceling for bullshit is bullshit. And honestly, I kind of hope that that Uber driver is mad with themselves for not trying to find her because had he picked her up or she, Sammy would still be here. And I know that's a lot of blame to place on one person for a stupid mistake, but it's true. And also, I just really hate the fucking drive share stuff. I'd rather just get a taxi. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, and I'm not victim blaming for Sammy for getting an Uber or for her decisions. In fact, she was being smart, and we all know it because she was drinking and she didn't want to drive. So, you know. Anyway, they look at the car and they see that there isn't a visible license plate, but they put a bolo out anyway for a dark colored Chevy Impala. Shortly after interviews with family and friends, Special Agent Lee Blackmon, or Blackman, I'm not exactly sure. They have Southern accents, so it's kind of a little hard to tell (laughs) sometimes with what the pronunciation is. But anyway, he is the one working on Sammy's case, and he gets called to five points because 
an officer pulled over a dark Chevy Impala. Now, when the driver is told why they're being pulled over, he basically, because the cop says, you can see the footage in the episode, that, you know, he's like, hey, I pulled you over because you have a vehicle matching the description of one where a woman was kidnapped. Of course, as soon as this is happening, this guy decides to run, which is never a good sign, innocent or guilty, but clearly this guy didn't care, so he ran anyway. Now, when police officers are just looking into the car, and I mean literally just looking, they have their flashlights and they're just peering in the windows, they can see that there is blood on the back seat and in the driver's seat. As soon as they start to conduct more of a search, they find a phone matching the description of Sammy's in between the driver's seat and the center console. They also were able to find narcotics in the car. And again, this is not a full-blown, you know, CSI's investigating the car. This is just the officers doing an initial search. Police are able to catch the man who ran away, whose car it was who ran away. But he claims he has no ID on him. And when they tried to ask him questions, like simply like, what is your name? He's very uncooperative. So police do the only thing they can do, which is run a fingerprint scan. And when they do so, he comes up as 24-year-old Nathaniel Rowland, who is a native of South Carolina. Now, eventually, he says he does want to talk to investigators. So Special Agent Blackman is the one who goes over to speak to him. And his first question, Nathaniel's first question, is he wants to know why he's being detained. So... Special Agent Blackman tells him, you know, that his car seems to be related to the disappearance of Samantha Josephson. I mean, I don't think he says her name, but just, you know, a senior of University of South Carolina. And Nathaniel says that he went to a party, got really drunk. He fell asleep at the stadium suites. And when he woke up, his car keys weren't in his pocket Um, that he eventually found them, though, and when he tried to find his car, it was not where he had initially left it. So basically, he's claiming that someone must have borrowed his car at some point while he was asleep. They then take Nathaniel to the annex that they have set up in the Columbia Police Department. After some questioning by Special Agent Blackman, Nathaniel just stops talking and does not want to be cooperative, which in most cases, even if you're innocent, it's fine to not talk. I don't think there's anything inherently suspicious about him not wanting to talk to police, especially without a lawyer, because he doesn't have a lawyer the entire time he's being interviewed. So, you know, like I said, it's hard to be extremely suspicious of him solely for that reason but as investigators bring the car in and the forensic team does a full search through (laughs) they find reason for him to be a suspicious person because they find that the child locks in the car had been engaged so essentially whoever is in the back seat or the passenger seat you cannot get out of the car when that is on obviously we know this which means Sammy wasn't able to get out even if she wanted to, sadly. They find more blood in the car, which most investigators said there there was just so much. It soaked through the seats and into the foam seating, and it was just everywhere. But investigators were able to get a DNA match to the blood to being Sammy's. Hi, this is Andrew, and I'm interrupting what I know is an enthralling interview because I want you all to know that we are sponsored by Broadview Press. And if you don't know, Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher who publishes books covering topics like English studies, writing, philosophy, history, gender studies. And every season on the podcast, I interview one of the Broadview Press authors. So for the fall, we had Ann Stevens on to talk about literary theory and criticism. She played a Wizard of Oz literary game with us. She talked about why Bridgerton actually involves literary theory. So does Fifty Shades of Grey. 
who knew? Um, and also, we just had on Jeffrey Weinstock, who wrote the first ever pop culture analysis book. So, you know, I am all things a lover of pop culture, especially my Hollywood topics, Real Housewives, the list goes on and on. And he also wrote the book called The Mad Scientist's Guide to Composition, where he's writing a book teaching students about how to write rhetorical strategies, but it's all around this metaphor of being in the mad scientist laboratory, because as you'll learn when you hear our episode with Jeffrey, he is a gothic and horror fanatic. And I mean that in all the best ways possible. So you don't want to miss Broadview Press's exclusive discount because you're listening to the podcast. All of you get an automatic 20% off. Use the code Ivory Tower for 20% off site-wide on all of their books. So our in our show notes, we have a link to Broadview Press. Make sure you click the link, put in Ivory Tower, and you're going to get 20% off your order. So enjoy your reading, everyone. Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and cre-cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E, Made It, or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs, and if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So, go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It, and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It. Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. And order today. Daniel Goldberg and Brian Gibson are two solicitors that are called to be like the main solicitors for this case. And for those of you who don't know what a solicitor is, it's essentially a prosecutor or an assistant, you know, ADA. So because like certain states in America, I don't know why we're so fucking weird in this country. Why can't we just all name things the same? I don't get it. But like in Britain, because if you know, in Great Britain, they call their district attorneys essentially solicitors or actually they just call their lawyer lawyers blah, blah, their lawyers in general solicitors so in some states like south carolina for whatever reason they decided to also call these types of lawyers solicitors so but anyway what's important here is that byron gibson and daniel goldberg are the two main prosecutors essentially for this case now, despite all of the evidence that, you know, investigators have from the car, police and the solicitors have to really put together solid evidence that puts Nathaniel Rowland in the car at the same time that Sammy was murdered. Because technically at this point, the notion that someone took his car is still valid. That still very well could be the thing. There's really not much evidence physical evidence aside from it being his that puts him directly in that car at that time so they start looking through Nathaniel's phone records and start comparing them with Sammy's and when they do that they find that both Nathaniel's phone and Sammy's phone were together from you know five points went all the way down to Roseland where Sammy's phone turned off. I'm sorry, not Rosalind, Rosewood, where Sammy's phone turned off. It then shows Nathaniel's phone going towards the area where Sammy's body was found. Now, 
even though it's more circumstantial evidence, because let's face it, he could throw in and say that he lost his phone or left his phone in his car, which was why, you know, whoever borrowed his car, that would show up that way. But it is enough for police to bring murder charges and kidnapping charges against Nathaniel Rowland. Now, this is another interesting tidbit that I learned, and I'm not sure if it relates to the way the solicitor systems work in Europe, but basically the solicitors are not the ones who ask for warrants. The police officers do, which here that's different. Normally, like in New Jersey, normally the police department sends the evidence to the district attorney's office, and then from there the charges are brought or warrants are issued because then they present it to the judge. Whereas it's kind I mean, I guess in kind of a way it's a little more fluid, I guess, because you're cutting out the middleman of the ADA or the DA. So I don't know, but I just thought that was interesting. Samantha's autopsy revealed that she had sustained over 100 stab wounds. And initially, it was thought it was just over 40. But like I said, with the autopsy, they confirmed that it was over 100. And these stab wounds were over her entire body. I mean, there really is not an area that, sadly, she was not stabbed. And what was interesting about the stab wounds was their shape, which was very telling to investigators because obviously this tells them that this was not a standard knife that she was stabbed with. Instead, the murder weapon had two points to it. So she was, like, there was always two points of the stab wounds that were very close to each other, which tells them that there's two points on the murder weapon, which is great because it distinguishes the murder weapon from any random knife, but that also means that it can be more difficult to find. Police reinvestigate the car and they look into an eviction notice that they find in there. And it's for a woman named Maria who also lived in Colombia. So police drive to that address and they speak with her. On April 3rd, 2019, is when they formally interview her. They bring her down, and she tells them that, yes, she knows Nathaniel, and that, you know, they were sort of together. And she says that Nathaniel was supposed to take her to work the morning of the 29th, but showed up late. When she got in the car, she sees something that she feels is blood, and there's a sheet across the back seat. When she asks him what's going on, Nathaniel just tells her, like, why are you asking me so many questions? When she sees him later that afternoon, she notices that the sheet is gone and that the entire car smells like bleach. Now, Nathaniel admits to having cleaned the car out because he said he had to, but the smell of bleach was so strong in the car that Maria felt that if anyone lit a cigarette in there, the car would just fucking blow up. She also tells police that everything he used to clean and all of what he cleaned is still in her trash. So police immediately get a search warrant for Maria's apartment. When they search Maria's apartment, they find the cleaning supplies, they find bloody sheets, bloody towels, bloody gloves, and a multi-purpose tool that has hair and blood on it. This multi-purpose tool was proven forensically to be the murder weapon, and it did have that weird like two blades crossing and they cross like very awkwardly I'm going to try and find a picture for the social media posts hopefully I have it by now (laughs) but when this episode comes out I mean but it's a very strange looking tool like it's almost like someone put in two separate blades in two different directions and it's it's just weird to say the least investigators also discover that Sammy's phone had been turned on recently after her death and it seems like the time between he drops Maria off at work and is cleaning out the car that Nathaniel drives to like a pawn shop if you will but really just for cell phones and electronics and he tries to get rid of the phone but it doesn't work 
Thankfully, the store has surveillance footage and the police can easily see that it is him. They have her phone and that he's trying to sell it. They could also see from the cameras outside of this particular shop into his car and they can see the bloody sheet in the back seat. Now, with all of this evidence, they can definitively put Nathaniel Rowland in the car at the time that Sammy was murdered. And, of course, because murder trials usually get put off farther into the future, the trial didn't begin until 2021. Sammy's family were there for every single day of the trial, and Seymour specifically points out how Nathaniel Rowland showed no remorse. In fact, actually, he tried to maintain his innocence. And at one point you can see his attorney saying that his family stands behind him and they think that the wrong person is being charged and yada, yada, yada. The jury did not seem to buy this because after an hour of deliberation on July 27th of 2021, they found Nathaniel Rowland guilty of kidnapping, murder and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. Roland was eventually sentenced to life in prison. Vigils on campus were held for Sammy by her family, friends, and Greg. And Uber and Lyft actually came out with statements after this trial and Sammy's death about how they were going to ensure what happened to her didn't happen to anyone ever again and that they would be taking stronger safety measures to ensure this. The state of New Jersey also reached out to Sammy's parents and they were able to pass a bill that ensures that rideshare riders could verify that they were in fact in an Uber or a Lyft and that they would have the right driver. And they did this by installing or using a QR code that riders could scan to verify their driver. This law is called Sammy's Law. Seymour eventually quit his job to run the What's My Name Foundation, which is a foundation that he and his wife Marcy set up in Sammy's honor. They also worked towards making rideshares safer by altering the questions asked when someone is getting into an Uber. By instead of asking the driver to instead verify who they are there to pick up, a.k.a. What's My Name. So... I mean, obviously, this is a very sad story, but thankfully, some safety measures came from it. It's just, again, it's just horrible that these things have to happen in order for changes, like obvious changes, need to be made. I mean, I've said this or feel like I've said this, (laughs) maybe not on here, but just in general in life. Like Uber and Lyft, like all of those rideshare things, especially before these new safety measures were put in place, were basically just virtual, like, hitchhiking. Like, you were able to pick up (laughs) a ride via the internet, like, hitchhiking. So, it's great, like I said, that these measures are taken, but, again, it's just so fucked up that this... that someone had to die, someone who wanted to help people, and was on the path to not only bettering herself, she also wanted to help people, so... It's just so fucking sad. But that is all I have for you, my loves. I hope you all have a great weekend. I know I will do my best to. (laughs) I mean, because I don't ever want to be like, yeah, I'm going to have a great weekend. And then, you know, shit happens. So I hope I'm going to have a good weekend. I'm going to do what I can to celebrate my birthday. um, Because on my actual birthday, well, the day before, I'm going to be cleaning. So, (laughs) you know, got to get that spring cleaning in, you know, in order to make my birthday feel so much better you know, but anyway, like I said, I hope you all stay safe out there. Verify your Uber and Lyft drivers before you get in. Do all of the things. And until next week, my loves, I will see you later. Thank you so much for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Andrew Rimby. I really hope you follow us on social media because that's where you get to see all of the exciting video clips, teasers, and humorous moments. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room and on our Twitter at Ivory Boiler Room. I hope you all are following the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe and become a member for only $5. You get all of our interviews and episodes ad-free. 
You also get to watch the video interviews. You get to see my lovely face and the guest's lovely face. And you get access to all the bonus episodes. So Dr. Jake Newsom talking about the history of the pink triangle. Zach Topping talking about being an army vet and what that meant when he wrote a war novel and a dystopia novel. You get to hear Gregory Maguire's breaking news about the Wicked movie musical. Jesse Green talking about Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein. And what did Stephen Sondheim actually think about Rogers and Hammerstein? So head to patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room. Please, please provide me an iced coffee. I would love it because I need to stay up to do all these edits. So yeah, see you all in the ivory tower boiler room cafe. And here is Mary DePippi from True Crime and Academia. Hi, everyone. I am Mary DePippi. As Andrew said, I am the host of True Crime and Academia. True Crime and Academia airs on Fridays at 730. Now to find all things True Crime and Academia, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at True Crime and Academia or on Twitter at TC and Academia because, well, they hate it when you have too many characters. Like I said, True Crime and Academia airs on Fridays at 730s. But if you are a subscriber, you get a bonus episode. That's right. A whole episode just to yourselves that no one else gets to hear. Like I do a deep dive on the case of Jean Benet Ramsey. I deep dive Casey Anthony. We talk about the history of the lobotomy. And most recently, we talked about the Night Stalker himself, Richard Ramirez. So. If you want to access all of that extra wonderful content, go to patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room. And like Andrew said, if you could just please buy us a nice coffee, that would that would be great. That would be really, really yes, great. It would be great. We appreciate it. We also interact with all of you on Patreon. So ask us your insightful questions. We will answer them for you. And we want to thank our spring 23 interns. Andrea, Caitlin, Rosie, and Sheila, thank you so much. And we can't wait to see you all back again in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy winter, everyone. <laughs>